This is a disclaimer. This podcast features four professional idiots who share their insights and anecdotes. This podcast is intended for entertainment purposes only. This podcast represents the opinions of the guests and should not be taken as medical, legal, or professional advice. All right. And I know there's five people. I wanted, I'll probably lead into, this will be the, you know, um, oh my God, make words, Daniel. Season finale, so that we can still keep recording, but give us more of a cushion. Yeah. Post again in a month or two when I have four or five, six episodes under our belt. Because we literally only recorded two episodes in a six-week time. Yeah. And so that I get, and we're all busy, and this is just to accommodate that. I'm not. I'm not. I'm. I'm. I'm never busy. I could. I could have done episodes. Right. <laughs> Just you and me talking shit back and forth for an hour. Oh, that would be uh, honestly. What's the way you say there, Ben? Uh, uh, honestly, what? just you and Dan shooting the shit sounds pretty fucking hilarious. I think you're gonna need to say like Ben and Doctor Ben. Oh, that's gonna be. That's how I'm introducing you guys. And Alex, I want you to open up. With the, like, how we met story. I don't know. Is, is it the how we met or the moving story? Which one's the moving story? The couch. Oh, that's right! I forgot about the couch! I forgot about the couch! Did we throw a couch off of a ledge? Ben, you yes. should... De- Benjineer, you should definitely tell that story after like oh, as yeah. a, like and you you technically like dented the balcony or something oh like that. oh there was no technically sir i don't know what you're talking about <laughs> did that ever come up did that ever be a thing no hey hey ben hey, i told them about it at their wedding they didn't know about it oh my god this is just this is just like you know it's probably not legal advice and like i don't know what the statute of limitations on mild property damage are but like maybe just let's not let's not <laughs> Oh, I, well, I we won't talk I about won't... the dent. <laughs> we just yeah, talk yeah, about was it more than three years ago? It is. Yes, it was it more is. than three years ago. Yeah, good. You, you can talk about it. What, what, <laughs> yeah, okay. fun. yeah, it was three years ago. Wasn't it? Yeah. it was uh, way more than three years ago, bud. It would be three years no, ago. Wait, wait, wait. In June. It can't have been three years ago because it was when you were moving, and I was still in law school at that point, and law school lasts three years. This is this was this was at least two years ago. No, because two years was the pandemic. Oh, yeah. You moved right before the pandemic, basically, right? No, he moved. No, we moved a year before. I lived in, I lived in the house we lived in at least 10 months. I don't know if you were in law school. You moved before I started law school then. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, weird. I don't you know. You were still in a lab. Um... I knew because you looked dead inside. We're past ah, the statute yeah. of limitations. Also, Yay. I'm glad Fuck that we're yeah. recording this. Mission is insufficient to form formulate probable cause. Also, so <laughs> so if that one apartment complex doesn't happen to listen to this, we'll be fine. <laughs> oh, you dumbass. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Overqualified Idiots, or welcome back, I should say, if you're tuning in after hearing prior episodes. This is the season finale, the final episode of season one. Ten episodes. It's been a long, it's actually been a lot of work. I have a new appreciation for how much time and effort goes into just editing and the process of making a final product, and that is why we're capping it. Uh, Season one at episode ten. I am Dan Casey, MD. I am joined by... Four additional professionals for, you know, a total of five. Because today is going to be something of a mega episode. I figure the season finale could have a little more time. Joining me as always, as our JD, is Pat Casey, my brother. Hey folks, how you doing? Season two will probably be brought to you by Knutson Casey, just saying. But (laughs) we may have an official sponsor. Yeah. So I should throw in, I had actually done a ton of work looking into getting sponsorships. And... Do you guys know how compensation works for sponsorships with podcasts on, th- on platforms like Spotify and whatnot? Nope. So you basically, if you get 100 or more listeners, it's, if you get less than 100, it's like a $50 stipend just to include an ad 
And if you make more, then it's based off essentially the number of hundreds of people. And it's kind of like, a, you know, it's proportional to the amount of listens or downloads you get. So you have to make the ad. You have to create it, edit it, and submit a final product to the company. They approve it, and then they say, okay, well, you're getting this many listens, so here's 50 bucks for your time. So I brought up that editing basically takes forever. And if you made a one or two minute commercial and edit it and added in their sound effects and their sort of, you know, licensing stuff, I'm assuming that's going to be like an hour or two of work. My time is worth more than that. And so if Knudsen and Casey wants to sponsor us. You know, Knudsen. 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 Casey. Knudsen. Nuts and Casey. Nuts, Nuts. on Casey. Jesus Nuts Christ. on Casey's. <laughs> That's a totally different podcast. Yeah, definitely different. <laughs> and who you're hearing speak now is Ben, our local rocket scientist. But we actually have two Bens today, so to keep it from getting confusing, you will be Benjineer. Oh no. <laughs> ben, say hi. I, hi. There we go. All right. <laughs> That's like the exact same tone, because I'd re-listened to the first episode so, yeah, a couple times. It was the exact same tone as when you said hi the first time. Because <laughs> I think I called you Ben the BSer, and you're like, uh, uh, hi. <laughs> Joining us as our second Ben is Dr. Ben. Dr. Ben is a DO in MedPeds, wrapping up his intern year. And yeah, Ben, say hi. Other Ben. Hello. I'm with the VA. How are you still? Oh, yeah, no, no, the I month ends today. Oh, that's right. Yeah, we're done. We're into hematology, oncology now. Ooh, is that, is that going to be tough? Oh, I love hematology, oncology, and it's going to be with kids. Literally going to be, like, hanging out with kids, watching movies. Perfect. Yo! <laughs> Playing video games. Time to show them movies that will change their life. <laughs> oh, God. I hope you're not talking about the movie I think you're talking about. Saw? Oh, God, no. I thought you were going to talk about the one you saw today. Jesus. Okay. Getting dark fast. That does not sound like a kid-friendly movie, if I recall correctly. You no. See, you say that, and then, like, my five-year-old niece watches, like, Stranger Things. She's watched, like, other horror movies, like Jason and all those things. Yeah. Oh, yeah, family-friendly films. Parent parenting in 2022. We watched Predator, Jaws, uh, I don't know. I thought you were about to say Tarantino, and I was like, hold up. <laughs> There's lines, and horror's fine, but what? And lastly, joining us also today as a special episode and something of a mega episode is Alex K. Alex, say hi, our uh, soon-to-be lawyer. Hello. I am graduating in like 10 days from, uh, from when this podcast is being recorded, so potentially, yeah. I'll be uh, a lawyer and then soon an attorney. Ooh. Fun time. Congratulations, man. Yeah, congrats. That's a big yeah. deal. Yeah. Any big celebrations? Uh, celebrations where it's possible. Lots of busy family members and things like that. But uh, I have to fly back to Phoenix. Um, actually, let's just edit that out, I guess. Like, I don't know. Just telling people where I'm traveling or weird things like that. <laughs> people are Fair planning to follow you. Like 20 people that listen to this episode. Uh, I've been taking constituent calls at the representative's office for the past like three weeks. And, um, you know, being told that I'm going to burn in hell and like people like calling and just like harassing you constantly gives you kind of like a sense of like, ah, so that's where internet culture comes from is just shitty people being willing to call other people. Well, I was going to say, isn't that like the rule of the internet? Like normal people plus anonymity equal monsters? And it's the same thing when you're just taking phone calls at like a place like that where people have very strong opinions. So, Alex, can you go ahead and tell the story of how we met? I was just thinking about that, and I wanted to hear you uh, <laughs> tell it from your perspective. So the context, for the audience's sake, the context this is coming up in is that there are two Bens on this podcast who we will now refer to as Benjineer and <laughs> Dr. Ben. Uh, Dr. Ben is the one that I have never met before today. So I was just casually talking to him right before, uh, Dan started recording and, um, was introducing myself. My name is Alex. And, uh, well, we were wondering like, well, how did you meet Ben? Well, or how, not how do you meet Ben, but how did you meet Dan? And, uh, so started talking about that and 
basically my wife and I, we moved into the apartment complex that Dan lives in. And we decide for some reason that we're like, you know, it was nice having some like friends who were neighbors in our last place. Let's go knock on the doors here and see if we can just introduce ourselves to some people and find some cool people in the neighborhood we live in. One of the first doors we try is Mr. Dan, uh, Dan Casey's. And uh, we knock on his door and this man comes flying, like aggressively opening the door open. He's a big, big gentleman. And uh, he is half naked and has nothing basically but a towel around his waist and is leaning around the door. And my, uh, my not then wife, but now wife and I are like, jump a little bit, look at this guy. And we're like, hi, we're just uh, new neighbors. And we wanted to say hi. And Dan was like, oh, oh, just a second. And then just closes the door and runs off to go get dressed. And just <laughs> Dan, I, I would love to hear your train of thought from that moment, like in hindsight, like I, I think we talked about this just being a very sore, like weird thing that you did, like that you did, but like, I, I would it, it's not a one-time occurrence. That's the problem. He did so, this in the dorms multiple times. What? Uh, yeah. Oh my well, God. So it's a habit. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes. I take showers naked. What do you want? I think there's a medical definition. I, I want you to not come to the door. If you're naked, I thought voyeurism. <laughs> Histrionic. Oh, it's exhibitionism. Exhibitionism. Yeah. Voyeurism is when you watch other people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was. Ex- I mean, Dan, there are worse looking men to do some exhibitionism around here, but you know, I, I just, you know, you, you felt, you know what, you felt like a safe choice. It's true. It's true. <laughs> I thought. No, I'd gotten out of the shower. I thought Nicole was visiting that weekend too. Maybe it was. Uh, uh, it was coming to like get her, and I thought I could get a shower in really quick. Whatever. <laughs> Point is, you weren't who I thought you were going to be. This is valid. <laughs> I'm very yeah. unexpected sometimes. So like that show up in a podcast said. after seven episodes. <laughs> so today's episode is, uh, I figured I'd end with a big one, and one that I have a few stories about, and I figure we can go around, go around the table and, you know, share some funny or just ridiculousness of, how the hell are you not fired? I think everybody has that coworker or person they've met, whether it's in an academic setting, if in a work setting, of just like somebody who is like so bad at their job, who doesn't give a damn, who's just so awful to people, whether it's coworkers or clients or patients or what have you, that is just like, why are you still here? How how do they not fire you? And while well, mind you, I know that usually the answer is they probably bring in more money than they lose in the sense of being whatever they are. But I wanted to get these stories from different perspectives. Unfortunately, we're missing some pharmacists, but that's okay, because we've made it up for it with doctors and lawyers and, and Benjineer. So I was going to kick it off with a short one. When I was in training, what, I think I've talked about the one story of the like resident, the yeah, I know, uh, story where the resident basically just leaned in the room and said, Oh, you know, you're going to die, right? Like with the door open, the hallway wide open. If anybody else was there, there'd been like huge HIPAA violation. That's not even what I'm getting at. There was a doctor that I worked with who, when they were documenting, and I know this because I saw their patients at follow up later. I remember going back and frequently what we'll do is we'll go through the chart and see like their old visits to see, okay, well, they were seen three months ago. What are they following up for? And this person was seeing me for their blood pressure. Well, okay. Pretty easy visit. Usually very straightforward. Usually just medication management and seeing if the patient's actually kind of, you know, tracking their blood pressure. I go back to the prior note. And one of the attendings who had seen this patient had, you know, written a note. It's hard to call it a note because it was one sentence. It was blood pressure 190 over 100 exclamation mark. Increase lisinopril. And that was it! That was the note! Oh, and the patient's blood pressure was outrageous like, that day, too. Like, why? Okay, if you don't know, 190 over 100 is bad. It is something called, like, hypertensive urgency and hypertensive emergency, where blood pressure is so high it actually causes organ damage. And you generally see that around 180 over 100 and 110. So, something that could very well have gone to the hospital, and it was one sentence long. It was in that moment that I knew I was never going to lose my medical license because if that flies, 
and people are okay with that? There wasn't a physical exam. There wasn't a review of systems. There wasn't, like, official assessment. There was just the plan of increase the medication. I don't even think they said follow-up in the note, but they were scheduled, so that worked out. That's when I knew I was safe. I was like, okay, all right, I'm going to be fine. Has anything like that happened for anybody in terms of just like, oh my God, it's really hard to lose my job because this person hasn't lost their job yet? Um, so I've got a very simple one. So I, yes, I'm an engineer. Currently, I do manufacturing. I just make things. Specifically, I do, I roll fiberglass and pour plastic. We had a fiberglasser. And I'm, I've only worked with a couple people, but I can guarantee this person will not listen to this podcast. That being said, I won't name them. So I worked with a person who blew up and just left. Like, blew up, well, slightly blew up and then just walked out and, like, clocked out and left. Like, four times. And one of the times, it's no secret a couple of us are in Arizona. So this is a shop in Arizona during the summer. There's air conditioning-ish, but it's still like 85, 90 degrees in the shop. And I'm pulling an air conditioning unit, a portable air conditioning unit over to give myself some airflow in a closed off room that is closed off to not let like pieces of like tiny bits of plastic fly everywhere all over the shop. And he just goes... This is the older-ish person. This is the problem with the current generation. They're soft. And I just turned to him and went, yeah, you're right, and continued pulling it over there. And that was just one of the times, which I believe is the same time he told our boss. He, he had very choice words for my boss, about my boss's wife, and about my boss's newborn kid. Oh my god, what the hell? And then left, and... Didn't get fired, and I'm still not convinced he didn't actually get fired. My boss says he quit. I think he fired him and just says he quit. But I'm like, okay, it's if I'm not like this guy, I'm 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 gonna be okay. Yeah, yeah, no, he was a thing. Keep him. This is also a guy who has experience in like he had done fiberglassing before wasn't actually all that good, even though he pretended to be hot shit. <laughs> yeah. I feel like that's a common theme of just people who are... What's it called? What's the curve? The Dun... Oh, God, I can't think of the name of it. The Dunning-Kruger effect? The, uh, basically, you, gotta, you know enough information to be dangerous, and like that peak of like, oh, I know a little about this. I must be an expert. That is exactly the thing. Alex, that is, you, you absolutely nailed it. Yep, it is Johnny Kruger. Okay, there we go. And so that's Cognitive funny... bias, whereby people with limited knowledge or competence is given an intellectual social domain generally over, greatly overestimate their knowledge or competence. I mean, this guy had experience, but he wasn't as good as he should have been. <laughs> he wasn't as good as he thought he was. So it generally that sounds too. like he had that problem, but he was also a terrible human. Oh, he, he was. He was. He insulted his boss, his boss's wife, and his boss's child? Newborn. Newborn. Like, I think within a month or two, newborn child. What the hell? And then walked out. And and does the thing where they come back to work the next day like nothing happened. Well, yeah, that's just a narcissist for you. To basically cause a problem and then pretend nothing was ever wrong to begin with. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. I'm glad to hear that he got fired or maybe got fired because at that point, just out of like sympathy for your boss, like, I don't know, I wouldn't stand for that. I I don't have much power in the sense that I can fire people, I think. Oh, God, I don't even know. I feel like now that I'm in my established career, I have no idea the scope and bounds of like what I am able to do. It's still very new to me. But like, could you get somebody power. fired if you're like, this person is dangerous? Well, yeah, if, if I put it that way in that perspective and, and felt strongly enough about it and had evidence to that point, yeah, probably. I don't know that that <laughs> the idea of disrupting somebody's livelihood doesn't sit well with me. So they'd have to be pretty awful, but that sounds pretty awful. That person sounded like they needed well, to go. Once again, this was not the first time he had done crap like this. That's weird. This was about the third or fourth. 
and my boss is pretty easygoing. Well, he has to be if that flew. We well, we were also in kind of crunch time. Fortunately, at this point, I have become like extremely competent enough that with limited number of employees plus him, aka me plus limited number of employees plus him, we can get a ton done. So he's not super worried about it. So there you go. So that's like my story is like the laziness version, the the lazy employee. How are you not fired? Yours is like the terrible employee. How are you not yeah. fired? The fucking awful person. I've got the uh, creepy. Uh, the creepy oh God! That. Oh no! <laughs> yes, uh, this is from back in my days working at the night shift at a laboratory. It was a, a, a testing laboratory, and we would go in there and run blood tests every night. Is that when you were uh, Maria's vampire? Yes, that's when nice. I was the vampire of the, <laughs> of the multiple things. Because I'm, I'm awake at all hours of the night, sleep during the day, and I'm around blood all the time. So, you know, just a little on the nose. But beyond that, <laughs> no, so... <laughs> I, Sorry, that I one got me. It just took a second. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no, no. So, around, like, an interesting variety of people at this place. Like, some real, like odd interesting people but like you know it's the kind of people like you might expect to work on a night shift just like it's a little bit different kind of folks but mostly nice people mostly perfectly reasonable people and then there was this fellow who i'm just gonna call melvin because i feel like that's a fun name just be like <laughs> fucking melvin I feel like it should be chester chester the molester Lots of things. Ooh, no. <laughs> no, Melvin's better. All right, Melvin. Actually, yeah, Chester actually is probably closer to certain things. <laughs> we'll get there. We'll get there. This fellow, this fellow was a guy who had been working there for about like 12 years or so, from what I understood. And he was the kind of guy who he would he would also be like kind of like just a bad employee, not like super effective at his job for someone who'd been working there that long. There was at least one time when one of the machines had a failure because he didn't put in a negative control into it beforehand, and it like lost like a hundred samples that were going to need to be either redrawn or like retested. Wait, a hundred and... blood samples of like yep. people's blood? Yes. Oh Jesus! Yeah, I mean logistically, that's got to be a nightmare. Yeah, I mean, most of the time there was enough sample that we could do a rerun if need be. That there was usually enough for that purpose in case something happened. Okay. Um, although that extra was mostly meant for testing follow up if you had a positive test, so it could have caused other problems. But yeah, and then the worst part with that though is that he also like basically like walked up to me and said like, "Oh, well." You know, we'll just say it was this failure and it's fine. And I'm like, you just didn't load the negative control. And he's like, yeah, but like, I don't have to get a preventable on my record because this job had like these little things called preventables. If you made a mistake that was human error specifically. Basically like a demerit of some sort. Exactly. And so he was basically saying, well, nobody has to get a preventable on this. if We just say this. And it was just like, uh, maybe... Maybe, maybe you, maybe you deserve one. it. <laughs> Fucked up. Like, hard. And now you're just trying to, like, act like it's fine. And, like, I'm, like, ethically unsure of, like, whether to go out of my way to say something about this or not. And then the next shift comes in, and I'm just like, eh, no, I'm not sure whether to say anything about this to other people. Like, this, this is, like, to, like, someone who's equal to me, not, like, reporting it to a superior yet. And I'm just floating the thoughts about it. And then they go like just turn around and just report it for me, which was which was nice to just have that taken care of. But there you go. No, it it got reported, um, and nothing happened to him, which was interesting. Like there was like no discussion about like the lying aspect of it or anything else. And then from there, it only gets weirder. Uh, So he was just like a creepy kind of fellow, like a little bit weird, kind of had a weird smell about him, things like that. Ugh. Uh, but also just like strange kind of clingy personality where like he would latch on to people for the day and like you'd be kind of like, I can't get away from Melvin today. I can't get away from Chester today. Was he bald? Was he bald? He wasn't bald. Damn, I'm trying to very, picture him. He had like a layer of grease on him at all times. <laughs> I don't know how else to describe it. He was like shiny. That is that is oddly specific. Yeah, he's oily. It just it just is what it was. And it was so unnerving sometimes. 
But like, yeah. So that that was a whole thing. But like, no, I wouldn't normally hold that against a person. But then on top of that, he was just like really weird. And at one point, I just like offhandedly said like, no, like not in like a mean way, but just like, huh, you know, Chester, you're a real interesting fella. And he's like, what do you mean by that? And he's, and I'm just like, I'm just a little, you're a little odd. And he's like, oh, okay. Doesn't say anything about it the rest of the day. And then I find out he filed an HR complaint against me and said that I called him weird. <laughs> and that was a reason. Oh, no. HR complaint on my record while I was a temp worker on this night shift. So I was, I was contract. I was easy to get rid of if, if problems became apparent. And then he just did that apropos of me, like kind of saying like, he's an odd fellow because he was being a really odd fellow at the time. <laughs> what did he do? Did, you, know, you mentioned following you around. What, besides the vibe. Just saying, just saying really weird, slightly inappropriate things at weird times. But then like, here's like the mother load and kind of like the big one that the story has been leading up to it's like he eventually got comfortable enough around me that he would say things that like were obviously obviously inappropriate or not okay kinds of things to talk about and he would talk about like horror movies and like the gore and other aspects of horror movies and special effects and i was like oh he's just really into the special effects of movies i guess uh, and then he started talking about how he uh like certain practical effects and like was talking like about like really vivid details. Ugh. And I was like, Oh, this is getting really kind of gory and morbid. Like we're working around blood already. I don't really need this that. guy. This guy is serial killer. This guy definitely has bodies in his basement. He's got them in the freezer or buried out back. Dude, it gets worse. It gets much worse because at some point a conversation got started about the dark web at, at our job. Cause there was something in the news about it and someone brought it up. And Uh-oh. he starts talking about the dark web. And oh, I man. had a roommate at the time who was like a computer science fellow who I actually knew, who I knew accessed things related to the dark web for various reasons. Not for anything sinister, like just for like dumb shit. But, you know, it is what it was. Well, okay. <laughs> That's a whole topic, but I'll let you keep going. That's a whole thing. But this guy starts asking me about it and then says, hey, do you know if that guy, you know, uh, would know how to find snuff films? Duh. Duh. Find what? Huh? Huh? I snuff films. So I, being my innocent, like, early, early 20s self, did not oh, actually no. know fully what a snuff film was. I just knew generally that, like, that's a bad thing. I know that's a bad <laughs> thing. I don't fully know what it is. I can't even remember. And I went and looked it up specifically. And for those of you out there who are like me and just like ignorant of these things, because you never really wanted to know these things. It means explicitly a movie in which a real person dies at some point in the course of the movie, like a human death must appear on camera. And that is a snuff film. And so that's, that's a, that's so unsettling. grotesque thing to ask a person to like, you know, do you know someone who can find these things? That's an HR complaint if I've ever heard one. <laughs> God. One was filed. One was Good. filed, sir. Good. Because like, I was horrified when I found out. If that's on your record for saying he's weird, does that like retroactively get rid of yours? Because you were right. Right. He's weird. Here's the thing. Uh, I, as I said before, was a temp worker on contract. And oh. um, ultimately, this guy had nothing happen to him. I filed this formal complaint. There was an investigation. They took, they put him on leave, paid leave for like two weeks. Uh, they talked to me about it in private. They talked to a couple of other people about the situation and what had been going on. And there were multiple complaints against this guy about other things. Um, but he had been with the company for 12 years. And I was a temp worker who was causing problems and they just didn't renew my contract. And you know, Oh my God, it is what it is. Like, I'm not a bitter guy. I honestly don't give a fuck that they, yeah. Yeah. no, I mean, but he didn't lose his job. Did not help anything. Um, and yeah, he did not lose his job. Nothing happened to him. Uh, I know someone ironically at my, one of my later jobs, I met someone who had also worked at that same lab and was the same person who actually replaced me of all fucking things. <laughs> oh, God. 
So I knew they needed someone after the fact. So I know that it wasn't just like that. Well, what they told me, which was that like, oh no, we just don't need any additional people right now. We've got plenty of staff. They hired oh, someone immediately God. afterward. What a thing to say. And then, yeah, this this particular person, Chester the molester or the uh, <laughs> snuff film or watcher. the murderer. God. Yeah, or whatever. Jesus, like we a couple of us did joke multiple times of like, do you think that if God damn it. Sorry. That's his fucking name. I'll, I'll, I'll bleep it out. It's fine. Sorry. No, but a couple of us joked, like, if he got fired, do you think that this guy would show up to work with an AR-15 or something? Like, a oh, couple God. of us were, like, genuinely wondering with this fucking guy. He was weird, man. He was insane. It's funny. You mentioned that he's shiny, and I got a small, small story. It's not that that story is perfect. That's exactly what I wanted for this topic. The story I have was when I was an intern in the hospitalist setting, and we had you don't always get the most savory people in the hospitals. And one of the patients we had was an elderly woman, and her son would come and visit her. And so while we were rounding. I found out later, this was actually after the fact, and so kind of in retrospect my horror was very, it was very displaced, but basically we would round on this patient, and we'd go into the rooms, and we'd talk to this woman and her son, and her son was just always this kind of, he was bald, and that's why I asked about it was, it was the person bald. And he always looked like, like a little sheen to him, a little oily, and he was balding, and he had that stereotypical kind of just creeper like voice, like ah yeah, yeah, like whatever. I don't know how to mimic it or recreate it, but I'm sure that's probably close. My attending at the time had a newborn child. She was back from maternity leave. Kiddo was a couple months old. Turns out, I find out both the mom and the guy are like class three sex offenders in Arizona. And every time we would leave the room after just updating them on what the plan was going to be, he'd be like, take care of the little one. And it's just... Excuse me? <laughs> yeah. Would just... She, she, what? She was former military. She'd just like about face be like, yep, and walk out of the room. And <laughs> I didn't know in the moment... I knew it was weird and he looked weird. I didn't know in that moment that was like... The, the details. I didn't know that about them. And cl I think that's correct. I don't think I'm using that term incorrectly. Class 3 sex offender. Yeah, I didn't know what that term meant. That basically both the mother and him had a s sexually assaulted children is my understanding. Patrick, is that right? What part? Class 3 sex offender. Is that like... In your jurisdiction, possibly. It, it oh, okay. varies from state to state on how they classify offenders and 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 offenders is a broader like pool it doesn't just necessarily mean sex offenders it could mean just uh it could mean many different crimes that are uh person crimes that require registration so so i think that's i think i'm right on in that. that case though they were diddling little children based on what you're telling me god so that learning that later in terms of him just like Take care of the little one. Like, I get what you mean when you're like, this person's just not normal. I mean, yeah. Uh, there's, yeah. So, Dr. Ben, I wanted to hear from you if you had any, I don't know if it's incompetent or just like, uh, you know, difficult people you've worked with. Did you have any stories you wanted to share? Yeah. Shit. One that, like, really stands out for me. Ah. Uh, it was just so baffling to me, but uh, I was on day shift and I was on medicine at that time and I was on the wards and I was getting checkout from the night team and the night team um, intern had told me, yeah, so uh, had this patient overnight, you know, hypertensive urgency, as you had said, elevated blood pressures. Usually, you know, treatment is give IV medication. Sounds very Straightforward. <laughs> yeah, I remember. I, even I know that. So we had uh, IV medication for this patient. And it's, it's, a, it's a stereotypical one that we wrote for IV hydralazine, and then there was IV esmolol. So basically, they're two different medications to lower your blood pressure that act on different receptors. But there were very specific orders for how to give it. And the way that it's written is PRN, because of course, you don't want to just give someone the medication 
as scheduled. So when you write an order, of course, like for the medications, just for everyone to know, like you can either schedule it every, let's say, day, every few hours, or you can make it a thing called PRN, which basically just means as needed. You know, as needed if there's coughing, if the patient complains about it, that they're having coughs, if they're feeling nausea, you can give medication if they say something. But you can also write an order and say, like, oh, give it if the blood pressure is this high. Well, so I go downstairs and I'm like, hey, this person's been in blood pressure ranges where he's probably going to stroke out if you don't give him something. And we have the order written. So why didn't you give it to him? So this nurse, um, I, I don't know how long they'd been there. And it's, it's, it's very hard to tell because I'm new and... With COVID and travel nursing, there's also issues with just how people know the system. Right. Not everyone understands different electronic medical records. But this person, I asked, like, hey, why didn't you give this? Like, you see the orders there. She's like, yeah, I see it. And, like, I'm start my, my blood is starting to boil because this person still has elevated blood pressures. And she has her legs on the desk in the emergency room. She's playing with her phone, not even really paying attention. Oh, my God. And she's, I'm like, okay, well, so, like, why didn't we give it? She's like, oh, well, they didn't ask for it. What? <laughs> Fucking what? They're not called suggestions. They're called orders. Yeah, I don't know. So, like, she's like, well, it was PRN. I was like, I, I like, visibly start, like, laughing. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm like, like, you, you, you. and I'm, like, stuttering as I say this. Also, like, you, you're, you're kidding, right? Like. <laughs> What do you mean? It he has to be a joke. Yeah, like, you're kidding, right? Like, she's like, no, he, it's PRN. He didn't ask for his blood pressure meds, so I didn't give it. I'm like, okay, there's the comment in there, you see, that you give it for a certain blood pressure range, and you didn't give it. And he's like, yeah, but he didn't ask for it. I'm like, okay. You don't you're feel your me. blood pressure, or hopefully you don't. Well, yeah, and I was like, okay, so you're, you're thinking that he's able to know how high his blood pressure is, or that, you know, he's like, oh. It's like, it's been two hours since someone checked my blood pressure. I guess we'll put the cuff on and just, like, check it myself. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm sure patients think that all the time. Oh, my God. So that one really just, like, got to me where it's, you know, it just shows, even though everyone goes through, you think, like, similar training, gets similar has similar expertise, that at the end of the day, like, Stuff just either gets lost in translation or people just don't give a shit about their job and, like, what they're supposed to do. And it's, it's even, like, more blatant, like, the night shift versus day shift, like, battles between any profession where, I don't know, there's always, like, who does more work kind of argument. Oh, yeah, I saw that on night shift all the time of trying to get, like, patients to, uh, nurses to give medications and, and whatnot. And I can't tell you how many, like, Pages at 2 a.m. I get asking for pain meds, and I'm like, they have Tylenol, Ibuprofen, and PRN. Did you give that to them? You didn't document if you did. Oh, well, I just think they need something stronger. Oh, you do? Oh, okay. Go ahead and give them that first, and then call me back in two hours. That's even the better thing, though. We're like, in inpatient, like, it definitely isn't something that you would see an outpatient anymore, I don't think, at least. But, like, an inpatient man, the amount of times where I've seen, like, People, like nurses in general, where they have given a different medication because they tried to use their own judgment instead about what a patient needed or about what a patient didn't need, which segues into like, I had a patient who didn't get insulin for three days. Insulin, you know, helps lower your blood sugar for those that have diabetes. Didn't have it given for three days because they just didn't want to check the blood sugar. They didn't think oh they needed God. it because they were fine. Meanwhile, the sugars, when we checked it, were like borderline, like upper 300s, 400s. Did, uh, did anything happen with this nurse? Did anything come of that? You know, I'm not privy to that information for either the one that was in the ED or the one that was upstairs with uh, the insulin. But Because that's a write-up right there. Like, I feel like I, I got, I feel like I got written up. Like I'm, I'm wondering when you're, uh, when you're hearing these stories, are you having like... I don't know if you do any like personal injury work or like things like that, but like I'm having flashbacks to torts. Like <laughs> that's all I can say. I took med malp in um, law school yeah. and all that iatrogenesis. There's going to be some bad outcomes from bad doctoring, but no, we refer our med malp out. I don't do any torts. I try to stay away from PI stuff, but 
Oh, no, yeah, you're talking like lawsuit-worthy stuff. I mean, somebody's blood sugars get up to 400 because you can't, you, you can't give insulin, and then they have a... No, because nice they don't check it. Oh, the, 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 oh, you mean, so it's not just they're not giving medication, but the, the, the nurses aren't checking the blood sugars like they're supposed to to determine when the insulin needs to be provided. Correct. Yes? Yeah. So, like, the basic needs of the patient aren't being met. That falls well, Bill. That's negligence if something bad were to happen. Stroke, heart attack, death. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah, so that's why it makes us, like, cringe when we hear these stories. Because, like, this happens. This isn't like a, like, oh, this is a one-time thing. I feel like every doctor I've talked to has stories like these. Yeah, I feel like all of us have these stories, and I hear these stories all the time in terms of, like, medicine not being given medicine given you know, different meds like i think the one that really boiled my blood we had a nurse who we would call doctor so and so i'm not going to say her name because she would constantly just put in orders what you can do is you in some emrs you can put in orders for approval so that you as the nurse and this is frequently done just to help not burden doctors with just putting in every single order is they suggest it to you and then emr being Electronic medical record. Okay. Thanks, Ben. Appreciate it. So they propose an order to us, and then we accept it. And if you don't read what the order is, they can do whatever they want, which is, you know, usually it's just intended to be a helpful tool, you know, and basically share the burden of orders. But uh, I've had basically the story I'm thinking of is this nurse had a, the, chasing, the patient was complaining of, like, chest discomfort. Like, that's it. Not, not anything, no qualifier. She's like, okay, so I'm going to order an EKG and consult cardiology. And it's like, I didn't know any of this happened because it was four in the afternoon and never got a page and nothing heard of. And then I just see a note by cardiology in the chart. And I'm like, what the hell? This isn't a heart patient. This isn't anything. And so that's people doing stuff like... I guess we've talked about laziness, we've talked about awful people, we've talked about creepiness. People trying to do more than their job description. People trying to do more than they're actually intended to is that sort of facet of it I see in the hospital setting more than anywhere else. And, like, the thing is, that's a very dangerous game in and of itself, because, like, when you're at your level, like, especially if you're inpatient, like, you know, for me, like, when I'm able to review when people try and put things under my name, it's only, like, a few things. So I can either deny it or approve it, and I might look at maybe, let's say, two to five things in a day, right? But when yeah. you're in a tent and you have multiple, multiple notifications each day, you're exp- I mean, you're, you're trying to go through all of the different things and see what was ordered, what was not ordered, what's approved or not. Like, that's just a, I don't know, that, those are the yeah. things that scare me, honestly, because I've seen it done. And it's very frightening when... Yeah, I've, I've had in my inbox like 40 proposed orders. And sometimes, you know, you're in a hurry. You're behind. You want to get stuff done. You be, you know, everything at a glance or a skim looks appropriate. And if you're not looking at it close enough or know what you're looking for, you could approve and say, yes, under the weight of my medical license, I agree with this decision. And the, if you don't know what you're agreeing to, that's playing with fire, to say the least. I mean, I had a, like, going off of that same thing briefly, like, I had someone put in a, uh, basically, they put in what was supposed to be, they thought, a COVID test, right? Just a COVID swab on the patient that was going to be leaving, going to a nursing place. And they put in a stress test. And for those that don't know, basically, stress test is, like, trying to look at the heart, see, like, if there's any concerns for lack of blood flow, et cetera, et cetera. And they tried to say, and not only did they put it under not me, they put it under a different attending that wasn't even on that, like... Oh, my God. (laughs) So that person's not even the hospital. They can't approve the order. And it shouldn't happen this way, but sometimes those orders will get put in, they'll be proposed, and then they'll just do it before the order gets accepted. No one must have seen that order, unless you were in, in the patient's chart and saw it. Oh, yeah, I was just in the chart looking at, like, why does this person have a stress test when they're just getting a COVID swab? (laughs) They're supposed to leave. What is this? (laughs) Oh, my gosh. Yeah, so, and I'm willing to bet uh, a lot of these people probably are still working. But, uh, Pat, I want to hear more from you. Okay, so I got a quick one from when I was, like, 19. So I worked at the Man 8 theaters outside of uh, Metro Center. 
Oh and yeah. And I was just an usher. Like I just took tickets and clean theaters, right? So on the Wednesday, July second, nineteen ninety seven, I, I looked it up. I, I, I can't. <laughs> Good I, Lord. Memory. <laughs> I was I was kind of like, oh my god, Patrick, your memory is ma- no, not that good. So, anyways, it was the release of Men in Black, and uh, it was the the year before it was Independence Day. That year it was Men in Black. They, they they did that for like three years in a row with Will Smith movies. I didn't bring him into it on purpose. That's all I'm, I'm saying. His name just that time, but uh, this manager, <laughs> uh, you know, staffs us right. She's in charge of the scheduling. One person at the concession stand. And me doing ticket taking and ushing. Wait, and that's it. Total, total for eight theaters. Four, yes, and her, and that's it. Oh the no, the three of us for the whole theater for the release of Men in Black oh my God. in the middle of the summer. Oh yeah, Men in Black so one in the what? middle of the nineties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When yeah. Will Smith was hot shit. And ev- yeah, and everybody would go that opening day and you couldn't buy tickets online. You mean you had to go to the theater, stand in line and people would line up and you'd have to rope them off. And Oh my God. Oh, so, no. I mean, I'm running around, I'm running around trying to ush theaters, right. And take tickets. So I'm up and I accidentally sent some people to the wrong theater. And the manager says, you can't, you got to pay closer attention. You can't do that. And I said, yeah, no problem which is a typical response for me when I was a teenager. And she says, <laughs> you, <laughs> and, she, and she looks at me dead in the eye and she says, you said that the last time you sent someone to the wrong theater. And I looked at her and I said, well, maybe if you hadn't scheduled two people on the release of Men in Black, I wouldn't be prone to so many errors. I'm going to go ush the theater so that more people can actually come in to see this movie. And I walked away. Nice. <laughs> so this other manager comes on and, sh- and, and he says, just don't say anything more to her. Okay. She, she's really upset with you right now. And I went, how high I, she's probably like maybe like a minute older than I am. And she's somehow the manager <laughs> of this whole entire movie theater. And she's completely incompetent because it's not the first time that I've been scheduled and had to de- and had to deal with like a super rush or release or something. It, it, she's just an idiot. And I just told him, I said, she's an <laughs> idiot. Keep her away from me. She's so, she, she can't, she doesn't know how to do her job. I could do her job better than her. Of course, 19 years old, I probably could have. And so I mean, and of course, somebody has to puke in one of these theaters the one time. So I'm spending extra time cleaning the theater. And she's got the gall to come in and say, well, is this theater clean yet? And I said, no, why don't you come help me? And so the other manager comes back no less than 30 seconds later and says, I told you not to say anything, Patrick. And I said, what are you going to do? Fire me? I'm the only person here. (laughs) And that was my second job. Like I did telemarketing during the day and then I ushed the theaters. At, at, at well in the evening nighttime so i had already worked a, a shift doing telemarketing so in my line of work you know the the type of attorneys that you're seeing in this uh, uh johnny depp amber heard case uh, especially those that are representing amber heard oh um, no topical i wanted to hear this i those are a dime a dozen yeah. uh, i run into them every day every i, I call them family law attorneys so, yes, there are lawyers that go to law school that, that practice law and have been practicing long, long, law longer than I have that are incapable of asking a proper question, that don't understand the rules of evidence, that don't know how to lay foundation, that don't know how to admit an exhibit. So you're just getting to see what I deal with on a regular basis in court. And I, I, don't, I don't really rightfully know how judges do their job. Because I would lose my GD mind at some of these people as a judicial officer, hence the fact that I'm never going to be one. But I, I already am losing my mind on the record with some of them. There's a trial I had, right? Yeah. This attorney, family law trial. She is trying to ask my client cross examination questions. And she's asking two questions at once. And so every time she does it, I go, objection, compound question. And all the judge does is looks at her and says, Break up the question council. So then she doesn't even ask the same question. 
she asks a different question that has no bearing on the price of tea in China. So I object for the relevance and foundation. Sustained. So she goes back to the compound question again and asks it a different way. And I say, objection, compound question. Four questions in a row, swear to God, improper questions, every single one of them. And one of them misstated the evidence. And the judge just looks at her and goes, uh, can you figure out how to ask a proper question just once? And so, yeah, there's these people that, that still are able to like eat food and, and, and do this. I don't know how, but, you know. How do you not laugh in these situations? Like, when you're on the record, how do you not, like, on the record, just, like, bust out fucking laughing? Like, what is going on? (laughs) All right, so here's another situation. Same lawyer, different case. And we're dealing with a retirement asset, right? So during their their marriage, or during the the, the divorce proceedings going on, because I'm the second lawyer for for husband in this case, uh, because the first one was completely incompetent. So... So two Since incompetent lawyers, two incompetent lawyers trying to trying to resolve a case. That's dynamite. Anyways, um, they screwed <laughs> up discovery. They didn't. Get, so so this retirement asset is an investment account, like, like a stock portfolio. And, you know, it's it's 2017, 2016. So one company buys the other companies up. So this so one month we have the portfolio being X amount of dollars. And then in Y month, the same amount of dollars is in a different account with a different company. And I swear to God, both the the previous incompetent uh, attorney and me have told this other lawyer for wife, this is the same account. This company bought this company. Well, I don't know that. So on the record, I pull up on my phone The article of the one company buying the other company coinciding with the months months of these of of these things to the judge. And I said, if 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 we have to keep going on this, I'm gonna ask for attorney's fees from counsel because she (laughs) is absolutely one hundred percent intentionally misstating fact to inflate the amount of the marital estate. And, 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 and she just, she's chewing, she's got her glasses, her mouth. Well, I, I just don't know. I, and I looked at the judge and, and then ju- and it was close to four 30 and the judge says, well, we're just going to have to schedule this one off into the future um, because we don't have enough time to finish this. And I will deal with Mr. Casey's demand for attorney's fees. Well, that was January, 2020. Oh, no. So that case didn't get rescheduled until January <laughs> 2021. Oh my God. That's what happens when I write counsel before the trial. And I said, I still have my attorney's fees request hanging out there. And in all likelihood, this is going to be an even split, except that you're going to have to pay part of my fees. So why don't we settle it? So we settled it day before <laughs> the, the retrial a year later. But that's the kind of crazy that that, that, that that I have to deal with on a regular basis and incompetence. And, and we're the only ones that police that. You talk about, you know, uh, boards and, and, and HR and all of that thing. I, I mean, I got to make ethics complaints. And, I, and I've never gotten to that point. I, I have brought, gotten to the point of maybe bringing a sanction motion against an attorney. You know, remember the one that said F you, yeah, F you in yeah, court? Yeah, I remember the story. But... No, I usually just try to try to say, just do the right thing. Just ask people, just, just do the right thing. That way I don't have to police you. I shouldn't have to, but it is what it is. <laughs> say on a different attorney note, I have a friend who is a, an attorney, a, a licensed attorney in a state. I'm going to completely keep this anonymous. I'll, the only thing you have to go on is my word. Who? This is not incompetence. This is just public defender speak. He has on the record, uh, and I'm like, did you ask the stenographer how they spelled that out? (laughs) (laughs) Also, uh, has on the record, uh, he was pronouncing a client's name and, you know, public defender, so many, many clients per day, and it was a complex name, and the judge goes, sound it out, and he says, sorry, Ron, or hooked on phonics didn't work for me. (laughs) Nice. I like it. That's great. Anyways, That's on the record. Just just some lighthearted asides. 
Oh, that's that's awesome. I I have never, and I mean, it's topical, so I may as well bring it up. I've never seen a lawyer object to their own question because they didn't oh, like that, what they're. I have. That wasn't the. I, I have hundred percent. How? Yeah. Why? You asked the fucking question. What did you not? No, no, yeah, no. I need the says, story the now. Judge says. The judge says that you, you you can't object to your own question, and then they see Depp and his attorney just absolutely <laughs> losing their shit, just laughing like this is just a comedy of errors. I mean, it's so bad. Well, wait, wait, wait. Okay, so Pat, correct correct me if I'm wrong, but. Wouldn't the correct thing just have been to say that it's it, you're you're making a motion to strike because what the witness has started with is hearsay. You were asking a question to prompt an answer, but the answer you ended up being the, the given objection ended up being it, a hearsay answer. Yep, Alex, you're you're close. The objection is, uh, Your Honor, not the answer was non-responsive, and I'd asked and I'd moved to strike the record, and then re-ask the same question. And and do it a little bit more slowly, uh, just to be a little <laughs> bit condescending, but also to make sure that there was there was no lack of clar- clarity at the time. Because, yeah, the, the the expert in that situation, I think, didn't answer the question, ducked it. So it's objection, non-responsive, move to strike in that situation. And that lawyer is just a dumbass and doesn't know his objections and procedures. <laughs> He got too into saying objection when Depp was on the on the stand. That's that's all I take from that. Uh, no, it's just that that some people are just. Oh, I mean, you got bad doctors, you got bad nurses, you got bad lawyers, you got bad engineers. That that it's just you know it's a lack of competence or or practice or all of it. What do you uh, stupid? What do you call a med student who graduates last in his class? A doctor. Doctor. Exactly. I think that goes right. <laughs> that actually reminds me of another story. This goes back to intern year. What actually, do you get? What do you? What do you? But what do you call a law student who graduates last in his class? A uh, congressman. Your honor. Unemployed. Ah. <laughs> no, <laughs> your honor, stop it. <laughs> 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 it's a little too early to be burning that bridge. Sorry, guys. Yeah, no. judges are particular. Are typically competent lawyers. Most of them are people I practice law with. So, <laughs> anyways, I do have a public defender story. If you want me to go into it, I had I had three prepped, but uh, yeah, I'll let you. It. I, it's all fine. right. So I had this coworker. Uh, this is a million years ago now, and uh, you know, I feel like when I joined the office, I'd, I'd come over from private practice uh, to be a full time public defender because. I didn't like private practice that much. That's that's how bad I I did not like family law when I was younger. I still don't like it that much, but you know I'm really good at it, so I just keep doing it. But so I went full time public defense because I love doing criminal defense. But what I found out is I was officed with an absolute bipolar nut job attorney who clearly didn't know what she was doing. And so when she and I had a case, and this happened all the time in our office where I, I, we'd have co-defendants, right? And she just tried to tell me um, how to handle my case so that it would improve her client's result. And I looked at her and I said, no. And I just walked away. That was it. That was the end of it. I just said no. And then she read me the riot act in the middle of the hallway of one of the courthouses, just, just screaming at the top of her lungs at me that I was incompetent. I didn't know what I was doing. I was an idiot. All of these things like for everybody else to hear. And I, and I just, I didn't say a word didn't. And this is how I thought back then, how I wouldn't think this now, because I knew I wasn't, there was no, uh, no winning for losing. So I get back to the office. So I started looking for a new job. When is enough enough for you? When do you actually stand up and say something instead of altering to the line? Yeah, I think that 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 um, I think that the older you get, that line gets blurrier, and I think that's because you have more experience to gauge the level of incompetence and whether or not it's worthy of reporting or going through that fight or not. Um, I can tell you that there's three lawyers for various reasons that should have been suspended or punished 
um, for their relative behaviors. I got three on the list that I can think of and I've talked about on a regular basis. And so you get, you, you got to really, you, you, it's, it's a self-policing thing and there's ethics like you're talking about, but at some point when you're in a small legal community, you have to weigh that is the blowback that I'm going to get from doing this worth it? Is it, is it really worth it? Um, you have to really think about not just the ethics of it, but just the totality of it. And in, in two circumstances, it has been worth it to, to, to stand up and take the flack for it. But discretion is the better part of valor, you know? Yeah. And that's a, I, I, I like your response, Pat, cause it's very judicious. It's, in medicine, there is the duty to report when you think of somebody being incompetent to the point that they're going to cause harm or being, um, whether it's due to substance use or whatever, just being incapable to practice and, and conduct themselves. Like, uh, you know, I, I I don't think that's an obvious answer. And like you said, the line in the sand gets blurrier for medicine, Ben. I think it's really when you think like, man, I hope patients don't go to this person because they're going to get hurt. Like, what was the Christopher Dunch? I just looked it up. Dr. Death, the spine surgeon who basically paralyzed five people, like in Fort, Fort Worth, Texas or whatever. That's, that's when you kind of need to draw that line for yourself. And weighing the blowback and whatnot in medicine it, and your community, I think that's a tougher, uh, I don't know, maybe in the legal community it's tougher. In medicine, you know, we have the medical board. We have anonymous reporting so when you have those concerns those resources are not something that i could do i can't yeah. do anonymous reporting i'd have to put my name on it i would I say mean, and even if i didn't the the person based on context would know exactly you know who it was right so in medicine i think that we have this anonymity part of it but also the duty to report and it's a slight it's a slight unpopular opinion but i think if they're if you have legitimate concerns they're going to harm someone then yeah, that's that's when I think the line is for me, because yeah, if they're a douche or they're just you know bad at their job, that's oh. one thing. But if they're gonna hurt someone or maim them, yeah. that's when I I get really concerned. Well, think about it this way though: there was a, the closest I've ever actually come to making a complaint against anyone from an ethics standpoint was actually a judicial officer. Oh really? And, and the, yeah, because I had a default order. And a divorce, meaning the other party didn't respond and we get what we asked for. The judge took 121 days to issue the order. What? Excuse me? Yeah, the, the, those default orders, one, should be done within like a week. Like, I was going to say, you know, I was like, what is the normal turnaround? In fact, I mean, well, I mean, right. No. Yeah. So the, I gave him the order. The order that he signed 121 days later, same document I, I gave him. <laughs> and, and 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 the the rule even in a default context in a divorce would be 90 days wow i, I got to day 120 and i told my legal assistant and i said uh i'm making a complaint tomorrow i have to this is ridiculous so i looked up how to do it i had the form on my computer uh, partially filled out and said okay i'm filing it tomorrow lo and behold what do I have my email inbox, but the electronically filed order the next morning. Mm. So thank God I didn't have to make the complaint, but I was mm. to that point. There's no other recourse. <laughs> what am I, I've talked to the, the judge's law clerk a uh, hundred times. Like, you know, Joe, Bob, what the heck is going on with this order? It's a default. Just have him sign it. It's literally just a signature. Oh just, my just, God. That's just, amazing. just click a button and you put your e-sig on it. Judge, give me a break. Yeah, that's so, wild. Yeah. I can't imagine yeah. that. In my in, yeah. in medicine, we have like FMLA paperwork. We have disability paperwork for, you know, if you can't work, that's kind of the big like time vampires on our side of things. And yeah, it can take me a few days to get to it. And sometimes patients don't tell me all the information I need to fill it out appropriately. Because really the correct answer is fill it to your best of your knowledge. Do you think this patient can work or can do X, Y, Z? And so that takes up a lot of time and some of those things get pushed back but i've never gone more than like a week without filling out long detailed forms for patients like you know that's their livelihood that's how they get paid that's how they feed their families like they can keep the lights on i can't imagine four months to just put your elect to click a button how does that happen anyways 
I had one short story. I figured I'd try to lighten it up a bit. Because, uh, I, w- yeah. I was going to say, Dan, do, what, do you want me to end with the short, the, well, the seven oh, yeah, short yeah. stories of why, why we shouldn't be employed to be movers? Yeah, that's true. That's, that's a good one to end on, actually. Okay. And that's what I wanted to hear from Alex, maybe, if he had anything more to add, too. I, I do have another short story that is a little bit more lighthearted by comparison, I suppose. Yeah, perfect. It, it is. Uh, it is about uh, my experiences in the Zoom School of Law, which is to say, <laughs> the version of law school that all of us uh, had to live with while uh, while we were doing online only and everything. Yeah. So I was I was taking a, a class on comprehensive patent practice. I have a professor who is, you know, she's a she's pretty strict, but very smart and. You know, a, a nice person overall, but like, if you piss her off, you piss her off, and you know. But the thing is, is that like a lot of the time in class, it was kind of hard to tell what she was thinking about like answers people were giving, and so it kind of made it hard to know like, are we going the right direction or the wrong direction? What I found out pretty quickly in that class is if you pinned her her actual camera to the top of the thing so that I could like watch her face a little more closely. I could see pretty clearly when she was like, Oh yeah, this person's on the right track. Or when that, when she like wrinkle her face and be kind of like, mm, no, that, that, not quite. Just wearing her emotions on her face. Exactly. So it was a lot easier to kind of read whether you were on the right track with like claim language or other patent related nonsense. Here's the thing. Sometimes she would also have guest speakers, which obviously like, you know, you're a little like you're, you're putting yourself out there a little bit, like you've reached out to someone from another group to offer them to come to your classroom and teach a thing. So, you know, you want your class on your best behave on their best behavior, right? Well, this guy, is, uh, is one of the one of the people in this class, this class of all of, I will say, 11 people, because it is a very specialized topic area. Oh, for exactly. no. oh God. It's not like you can't see them all if you've got it in gallery view or something like that. Are you are you also forced to have your camera on because you it's are supposed 11? to have your camera on? Uh, it's in theory an ABA requirement for us to have our cameras on. Really doing virtual because oh, they that's, need to make sure that's that you are there. That's oh. interesting. Person, they show up in a towel like Dan would. <laughs> Hey, hey, hey now. <laughs> Shut up. I have heard about wardrobe malfunctions, but that's not what this is. Uh, what this is, is that about halfway through the presenter's uh, situation, I have face still pinned. Uh, sorry, god damn it. I keep saying names. I'm not supposed <laughs> Don't to. Don't bleep it out. You'll be fine. God damn it. <laughs> anyway, no. Uh, no, okay. So I, I, I see, I have this person's face still pinned, my professor. And then I just see at the top of the screen, this guy has left his microphone on by accident and has his camera live and cracks a beer open. Ah. That classic Chris. <laughs> <laughs> now this class does take place at like four 30 in the afternoon because this professor works okay. her own law firm on the side. So like she's doing class later in the day, but like, you don't crack a beer open at five o'clock just because it's five o'clock in the middle of your class, especially when there's a guest speaker. And, <laughs> and what he proceeds to do then is just, slam down the entire beer in one pr- prolonged chug on camera for everybody to see. Please say everyone is just dead ass, just like watching. No one's like talking. The, the, the presenter, the presenter is definitely like still going. And like, I can tell like, there's like a point where he clearly notices it. Cause like he like, you see his eyes dart a little bit and he's like, huh? Uh, uh, Oh, but consummate professional that he was, he kept going. I, on the other hand, have <laughs> my professor's face pinned to the thing, and I can just see like a flush of red and like a growing rage about this situation. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah. That guy was still in our class the next session. Wow! He continued to be in that class for the rest of the semester, and that is my final story of like I don't know how that guy did not get kicked out of that class. Like that was <laughs> oh like, my gosh. such a stupid thing to do. Eleven just, people. Is, is that something though where you could get like? So I guess like it's foreign to me because like you know in pharmacy or in, in like med school, you can't. It's not like if you do something fucking stupid, you get kicked out of the class because. 
got to take the class. So like for that, would you get kicked out and you have to just take another course then? Yeah, it's really hard to get kicked out in medicine. It's, it's generally very difficult. Uh, but I mean, like, imagine the state, like the difference in standards that we're dealing with, like in that case with Zoom versus other things. If you brought a beer onto campus into a classroom and then just popped it open and chugged it right in front of your professor and didn't at least get kicked out that moment or like kicked out of the classroom Wait, for that class. Can we have a, an episode next on Zoom crazy, stupid stories? Oh, I mean, God, do we have yeah. enough to like fill a crazy? I've got like. 17 off the top of my head just but that that's but, but law school you. students I, I never remember anybody cracking a beer in class in law school i do remember people just asking dumb questions ad nauseum like you obviously didn't read this or comprehend it but never crack a beer in class <laughs> <laughs> this is something i think i don't think never needed to be said don't open beers in professional classes my story is a little <laughs> that's awesome i still I, I have a little st- tidbit off of that. In med school, there is uh, this section uh, in the first two years, it's typically just classroom learning and lectures. There is the endocrine system as like a month block, and one entire lecture is dedicated to alcohol. And so that lecture is always held at 8 o'clock in the morning. And in med school, uh, recently, all of our non-required lectures are um, recorded and pre-recorded, and you can watch them anytime. So if some people can't actually make it on, they can just podcast from home. And that was frequently done for the earlier sessions. Uh, so the alcohol lecture, and I don't know how this tradition got started, students would pre-game the lecture by having mimosas at... The 8 a.m. lecture. At 7 a.m. at somebody's house and go to the lecture drunk. And that was a med school tradition that just became accepted because that was a fun thing to do. I never had the balls to join in. I do know several very, very good doctors who did do that. And I was thinking about like, man, if it was any other teacher or, or excuse me, um, uh, lecturer or professor that was just very cool with it and probably an alcoholic himself, if they were thinking back on it. That would never have flown, but yeah, no, nobody got in trouble for that. That's something that happens, and as I don't know if it still happens, but well, COVID and all. My other story that I was talking about earlier had to do with somebody I knew in my intern year. This wasn't incompetence per se, because he's actually a very fine doctor. I know him well, and he's very good at his job, but he was pretty anxious starting out, and this was a story of when we were rounding. We, he just kind of had... He was out of sorts, mixing up patients. And if you've ever been doing rounds where you have an attending pimping you and asking you questions, it's very stressful because you need Sorry, to know. Did, did you yep. say an attending pimping you? Yep. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a phrase in medicine where it's oh. just like rapid, like boom, boom, boom questions, like back and forth. Yeah, you outed yourself for not listening to that episode. We talked about this. I think Alex actually asked me to define it, and it's pump phrase is the, the German word meaning to pump you full of questions. It's the cadence and the fast speed in which you ask them. That's where that term comes from. Not getting pimped out on the street by my attending, like... Socratic method at work. Yeah, exactly. So it's stressful. And this particular doctor that I was working with was just very anxious and on edge and was just having a bad day. We go and we round. When you round, you go around, you see the patients, you talk to them about the updates, you talk about labs, you talk about what the plan is. He goes in and he sets, I think he has a coffee with him, and he sets it down on the table. And then at one point, he's obviously kind of a nervous mess because he's talking to the patient, trying to give updates. He's been stressed. It's been a rough day. We all have bad days. He reaches for the coffee that is on the patient's tray, takes a sip of it. It's not his coffee. It is the patient's. Realizes what he's done and spits the coffee back in the cup and then looks at all of us just horrified of like, Oh, uh, this one's not mine. And that was <laughs> that burned into my memory forever. <laughs> oh, my oh my gosh. I just like, uh, I know we've all been probably in situations where we're anxious and nervous and maybe say or do something stupid, but I still remember his face in terms of just like grabbing the wrong coffee, taking a sip, and then the, the reflex of spitting it back because you know it's not yours. <laughs> But Ben, you had a you had a funny story that also talks about oh god, it's about me, isn't it? Yeah, a, a, and a friend who we'll call Jim. Yeah, that's pro- yeah, that's. <laughs> oh, go for it, man. 
So Dan is moving out of his apartment. Uh, the one earlier mentioned. Yep, the one right above mine. It is a third floor apartment. It is in Arizona, so there's... Well, I guess this is true of many places. There's no, like, indoor thing. There's absolutely no elevator. It's all outdoor stairs. Dan, living the bachelor life before his now wife had moved back up there from med school, had a heavy as fuck couch that was broken. And we, being three males in our 20s, did not want to move it down the stairs. It's broken. No, that was miserable it. putting it up there the first time. It's going to... I'm glad I wasn't... I'm glad I didn't know you yet, because I would have probably been called to help. <laughs> so, instead, Jim and Dan, I don't remember whose idea it was, they go, Ben, you go downstairs and keep watch. We're going to heft this thing over the railing. That was 100% J- Jim's idea. That I, I almost said the right name. That was 100% him, but I was just like, oh, what's the worst that could happen? Yeah, let's So do that. I, I go downstairs. It's like gravel at the bottom and like sidewalk. You know, they, they get this couch. Also, note, I'm the smallest one of the three. Like, Jim and Dan are both, like, taller and just bigger. So, uh, okay. Dar- oh, darn, I don't have to heft a couch. <laughs> you uh, don't have to. So <laughs> I'm, I'm down there keeping watch. I'm like, okay, go. And they heft it over. It flips and turns and crashes into the ground. <laughs> we yeeted it out the, the patio side. Sure did. Yeet wasn't a word yet. That's how long ago that was. Oh, that's right. Yeet wasn't a thing yet. Yeah, so the couch was a very, very nice couch. I inherited it from a dead person. And so it was a lot <laughs> nicer. <laughs> it was a lot nicer than any other couch I'd ever owned. But it was heavy as shit. It was like hardwood, and like the cushions wouldn't come off to make it lighter. Yeah, so me and Jim had been, I think it was me and him who had actually moved it up the first time. And we were like, oh, fuck no, we don't want to do that again. So we yeeted out the third story, like, balcony. Balcony. It does a flip, and when it hit the ground, it shattered into, it, like, like, a pile. Uh, it was a literal, like, <laughs> puddle of couch. I was going to say, shatter's not the right word, but it crumbled. Yeah, it shatter, just, like, shatter implies things fly. It just went Kroof. Yeah. And just crumbled. And then and trying to move uh, that to the dumpster was just a mess. Oh, you're missing the part. Which part? Then a man who none of us have ever seen before walks up with his hands behind his back and is looking at this pile of couch on the ground. Oh, this part I forgot about this. And we and we're like, oh yeah, it we dropped it and it fell apart and you know and he like goes to start doing it. I'm like, oh no 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 like you go start helping us move it. I'm like, oh that was oh, no, 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 no. I pointed it's fine. I, I pointed at the couch and I said, No, we got this. You can go and I gestured like you can go around. The guy was deaf. The guy points at his ears and like makes the no signal and we're like, cause cause we're worried he hurt us. Yeah. <laughs> and the guy pointed his ears and makes like the no signal and we're like, oh my god, he's deaf. Holy and shit, my, we got away with it. And when I pointed at the couch and gesture around, this was the other part, I pointed like around, he goes, oh, okay. He like, he kind of says, oh, okay. And then goes to help us lift and move it. I was like, whoa, 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 wait, no, no, no. And I like, my There's brain like short circuited. I didn't know furniture how Furniture to... tacks coming out of everywhere. Oh yeah, there's like nails and sharp edges. So, and just like, I don't want this random, apparently good Samaritan to get hurt on our fucking mess. So I, my brain short circuited, but Jim apparently, who's much smarter in the moment than I am, just did some vague sign language to actually say no we got this don't touch it because it's sharp yeah and yeah and then we moved it to the dumpster and that's why we shouldn't help you ever move your couch (laughs) and i still have my job well hopefully you make enough money now you could have somebody else move it for you i mean you start getting to be my age and moving means you're paying some other asshole to move it so (laughs) absolutely herniating a disc is not worth pizza and a beer no no shit (laughs) But that being said, uh, any, I think, gosh, yeah, we've been recording for like an hour and a half almost. Anybody else got any stories they wanted to add? I'm going to play in uh, my first over-the-board tournament since I was 17 years old in June. 
Being chess? Nice. Yeah. Nice, man. That's yep. awesome. Are you, you've, I was going to say, you've been practicing a lot. I've been playing quite a bit over the last year. Yeah. I've actually been taking lessons. I don't have to include this, but who won between Pat and Alex? Uh, he won all but one game, Alex. Yeah, I think we played three and it ended up being like, I won two, you won one. <laughs> and the one that you won, I, I should have won, but I just completely blew the end game in he a really spectacular bed. way. And you just, just destroyed Yeah, it. he shit the bed. <laughs> shit the bed. Well, I mean, yeah, he totally shit the bed in that game. Otherwise, he was, he was it, dominating. It was, I, I think I was up by like five pawns and I somehow snatched defeat from the jaws of Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. Yeah, good times. It was awful. <laughs> and with that, we're going to go ahead and bring this episode to a close. And with that, season one to a close as well. Thank you guys for joining me today. I love doing this. This is a ton of fun. And thank you listeners for tuning in. Uh, I've never really made anything before. So for me, this is a ton of fun for multiple reasons. A, I get to put my name to something and actually like put something out there. But also I get to hang out with you guys and just, you know, shoot the shit. So, listeners, if you enjoy our content, please remember to follow, like, or subscribe on whatever major podcast platform you use. Download this episode and other episodes you listen to to show your support. We'll be back with season two in about a month or two. We just need the time to record it. And yeah, no, thank you all for tuning in. This has been a ton of fun. And as always, this has been Overqualified Idiots. And take care. <laughs>